Welcome everyone. This is our third ASSC event for the year. The next one is going to be a whole lot of fun. It is our annual holiday reception get together, and it's going to be at how do we pronounce it? Viali. Viali. This is where Maccabees used to be in the Maccabees building, but at Maccabees on Midtown, but it's now been changed to Viali's. And it, we should have a really good time. So everybody mark your calendar. We'll be sending out the date. is December 15th. Thank you, Tammy, who knows everything about everything. Um, okay, so I want to introduce, you know me, Marianka Holloway, Chair of ASSC. I want to introduce our ASSC this year, Cynthia Merritt. She's a member at large. Dawn Niedermiller. She's also a member at large. Sarah. I'm sorry, Sarah Doyle. Is it still Doyle? Yes. Is it now Doyle? It's not Doyle. I'm just Doyle. Our <laughs> co-chair, who's just getting back from attorney leave and joining us for the first time, um, and then of course Shauna Reavers, who is our other member at large. I got it wrong. So <laughs> that's our committee for this year. I'd also like to recognize the hard work of our union. is mostly done by, I shouldn't say three people, because Charlie's not here. We can say three people. Um, Tammy force is the force of this union i have to tell you for these events none of this would be what's going on right now without her we also want to um recognize michelle of course our executive director michelle Sacto, um, who also has been helping so much with all of these events and last but not least our union organizer mark dilly and i think you know all of them but just wanted to let you know that they've been very active in helping us put on these events and so recognition. So now I'm going to give it to Don Niedermiller, who's going to, to or, I'm Merit sorry, Cynthia Merritt. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Hello, everyone. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I would like to just share, for those of you who don't know, that the uh, ASSC committee does an annual um, service project on behalf of the union for academic staff and any others who want to contribute. Um, the information that you have, everyone should have, is the agenda. And then um, Dawn made a flyer, a nice flyer for us, that talks about the service project as well as our wish list, which we're going to talk about a little bit more. Um, I really appreciate those who have um, agreed to be donation sites. So we have a list of the donation sites and the contact person there, and other ways to support, so we'll talk about that. But basically, this is our annual service project. Uh, Dawn is going to introduce our guest. And she's from Alternative for Girls, and she's going to um, share more about that and what they do. So welcome, everybody. I appreciate everybody's being here. Um, just share with others who aren't here, with other academic staff who aren't here, that this is our annual, our opening of our annual service project. And we really appreciate everyone's help. This is a good cause, especially at this time. Um, we, we need to focus on serving and giving to others. So Dawn, Thank you again, everyone, for being here. Hope you're enjoying lunch. Um, in a moment, I'm going to actually introduce Alexandria Armstrong. She's the annual fund manager for Alternatives for Girls. And just to quickly mention that every year, we do look for some kind of cause where we can, you know, have as our service project. Last year, you may have participated in the snow pile, right, for Children's Hospital. So this year we chose Alternative for Girls because we were looking for something local also and we were very impressed by what they do. Cynthia and I actually about a month ago had an opportunity and we toured the facility. And if you'd like to tour the facility, um, Alexandria, Alex has offered that you may do so, you know, contact her. And you can see actually all the good work that they do in person. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Alexandria Armstrong. Again, she's the annual fund manager for Alternative for Girls, and she'll tell a little bit about herself 
and then she'll go into more detail about the actual facility and what they actually do there at Alternative for Girls. So, Alexandria. into this. We're so honored that you guys um, chose us to support this year. Um, we always need support, but especially during the holidays, especially in this time. Um, so it is so wonderful to know that you guys are there to support us. So thank you very, very much. Um, so Alternatives for Girls helps homeless and generous girls and young women. Um, and we do that through um, driving safe shelter, prevention services, and outreach services. Um, and we, we offer those to a range of ages from, from newborns, we could have uh, newborn babies in our shelter, um, up to adult women. We serve um, women involved in sex work, so um, we kind of offer a range of services for girls and women. Um, and I'll start with this short video um, and then kind of go deeper into some more programs. Detroit is now classified as the second poorest city in the United States. For the bulk of the population, I think that they have not felt a positive outcome from the recession. Girls and young women in Detroit, some of the pressing issues are to make sure that they can get um, an education, make sure that they can get all the support that they need. Just had a baby, still in school, had no family here. AFG offers an amazing, unique opportunity for uh, individuals who wouldn't otherwise have opportunities. The reason I joined AFG program because I was looking for another opportunity out in the world and I knew it was something beneficial. And plus, I was going through some things at the time and I knew AFG could support me. By having the after school program, the girls not only get an opportunity to come and just get help with their homework and things like that, but they get to interact with positive role models. When I got here, I realized that our Tunnel for Girls was more than just a shelter. Like it was a, it's like a community center for the kids around. They come here after school. Being an energy, I also had a mentor that helped me. He has opened my eyes to so much many things I never knew was there where it was academically as well as arts-wise or even a little advice that I needed. We have an after-school program. We have trips with that sometimes in the country, out of the country. We have a variety of summer programs. And then we have a shelter and transition to independent living for young women, for homeless girls. And then thirdly, we have the street outreach program, which provides services to young women for, who are particularly at risk on the street. I learned a lot about myself through AFG. Um, I was always an introvert type of kid. I've been accepted into Michigan State, Wayne State, Bowling Green, Ohio State, Western, and Central. I'm happy with the way my life is just now because three years ago it, it wasn't like this. People can help AFG in any way that they choose in any way that they can. That means financial support, it means in-kind support, it means being there to volunteer. It also means maybe just being a voice and helping others understand that AFG is here. AFG is one of the most amazing organizations I've had the privilege to be a part of. I think that Southwest Detroit and the city of Detroit overall are better because Alternatives for Girls is located here. I feel like if I did not come here, I didn't know where I was going to be. When you come to FG, you can get everything that you're not taught at home, but things that you should know to become a young woman, a young, strong woman, should I say. I like to be around when I have kids. Alternatives for Girls helps homeless and high-risk girls and young women avoid violence to pregnancy and exploitation and help them to explore and access the support, resources, and opportunities necessary to be safe and grow strong to make positive choices in their lives. Each 
of our programs and kind of how they have to in them. So just to begin, um, we, uh, just to begin a little bit about our history. Um, so we began in 1987, um, and we started in Southwest Detroit, we're still located there, um, but it was started by a group of community members who um, were living in that Southwest Detroit area by a former Tiger Stadium. Um, and it was neighbors, friends, community members who came together because we noticed a lot of things going on <coughs> in the community specific to girls and um, young women. So they were noticing that there were young women not going to school, um, there was an increase of homeless young women on the street, an increase of women engaged in prostitution, and um, an increase of girls becoming involved in gangs. So the group started meeting and talking about the issues and just wondering, um, and oh, they started at St. Peter's Hospital Church, which if you are familiar with that area by Old Tiger Stadium, it's just a kitty corner um, from where that is. So they um, just kind of began talking about it and um, were wondering if there were any programs for these girls and young women already existing. Um, so their original goal wasn't necessarily to start alternatives for girls. However, when they couldn't find an existing organization that was working with these young women or that was able to take these issues on, they kind of realized, well, there has to be something there for these girls. So um, after doing their research, um, one of the things that they learned was for a young woman who becomes homeless between the ages of 15 and 17 when they're still a minor, um, it's actually one of the most vulnerable times for a young woman to come from less, and that's because they're um, if they're not already in the foster care system, maybe some of you know this, um, it might be too late for them to be, have a foster case open for them. And um, even if she did go in a foster care system, it's often so you know busy that, and she's so close to turning 18, it just might not um, happen for her. Um, so in addition to that, she's also too young to go into an adult shelter. Um, because she's not yet 18 and she would need a parent or a guardian to sign her into a uh, place like that. So, um, so in addition to that um, and all the other things that they were noticing, um, they decided to apply for some funding. Um, but before they could get funding, it, um, the shelter kind of started before that came through. So one day in January, there was a young woman about 17 years old who fell into that same category. She was 17, she was homeless, and you know, foster care system wasn't gonna really help for her. So she knocked on the um, door where they were meeting at St. Peter's Church, and she said she was homeless and she didn't have anywhere to go. Um, so they decided then to just open their doors, and even though they didn't have funding yet, to just um, call everyone they could to volunteer and help this young woman. Um, they asked people to send them donations, and they would literally just take that day, donations from that day and go buy food and kind of just did what they could um, in the beginning. And that, after that young woman came, they had space for five beds um, and the, you know, was completely run by volunteers. So they eventually did get funding not too long after that. Um, and since then, <coughs> AFG has grown into a multi-service agency. Our budget each year is about $4.1 million. Um, and we have mostly about 75 on average staff members um, and we serve thousands of girls and women each year. So it has really grown in the past 29 years and um, it started as just a shelter but we now have um, our prevention programming and our outreach programming. Um, so let me just tell you some details about those programs. So first our shelter which serves young women between the ages of 15 and 21 and like I mentioned before, that is one of the most vulnerable populations. That's why we focus on men. Um, so, so, so they're sometimes too old to take. Sorry, I have one more. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll pull up the website. Yeah, um, sure. Because <laughs> it's, it's an excellent website. You can get more information there as well. Okay. Um, 
So a lot of times the young women are, um, who are old enough to go into the adult shelters are too nervous to go into them because they hear about violence and crime um, that go on to them. And sometimes that is you know, true and sometimes it's not, but we found that it was just um, better for them to kind of stay into the age group of 15 to 21 year olds. Um, so for that age range, we provide safe housing, food, and other items for them. Um, also provide life skills classes, and our primary goal is to reunite them with a family member through counseling services that we provide. Um, but if that's not possible, then the goal is to help them find safe, um, independent housing. Um, so our shelter has space for 30 women and 10 children at a time, but um, how many we can take in kind of depends on our funding. So right now we have about space for, we have 24 beds open for young women and 10 beds for children. Um, and over the course of the year, we serve typically about 125 young women and children. And um, we offer short-term emergency shelter and also a long-term program, which we call our Transition mm -hmm. to Independent Living Program. Um, so the program for our short-term emergency shelter is really just to give girls time to get stable, and many times these young women come to us after experiencing significant trauma. Sometimes they just need to be safe, um, be warm, eat some solid meals, and then they can begin to kind of process their trauma and start looking towards the future. So once the stabilization period has happened, um, then the young women can enter into the transitional living program, and um, they can participate in the life skills classes and help um, getting ready to be um, help being prepared, help them pre be prepared to be successful once they leave the shelter. Um, so they learn everything from resume writing to interviewing skills, financial management, and health and wellness. Um, they're also matched with a case planner and a counselor when they enter the shelter, and it's um, a requirement that they're either working or in school during that time as well. So sometimes girls stay for just a few weeks or a few months or sometimes a full year. Um, they also, they can stay as long as they need, but once they leave the shelter, we also provide aftercare services to help them um, stay on their feet. Um, so recently, a story of a young woman who came into our shelter, she had been chronically homeless her entire life um, due to her mother's struggle with addiction, and she relied on, relied on many different shelters in um, several different states throughout her teens. Um, and at the age of 20, sorry, <laughs> Just share with you guys that I'm kind of anxious right now. Obviously, you probably know. So. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I don't know. Seriously. It's just us. Bigger and lovely. Yes, just us. Aren't you supposed to be picturing us with our underwear on? Okay. So. Um, so she was she was 20 when she heard about alternatives for girls. Um, she was pregnant and she knew that she really needed to find real support for herself and her child. Um, when she became a resident in our shelter, she in, uh, got proper insurance, prenatal vitamins, and scheduled prenatal appointments with an OBGYN. Um, she also took life skills classes um, and parenting classes where she learned how to problem solve, um, learn problem solving skills, job readiness, and how to budget her money. So while she was at AFG, she got a job, she saved up money, and she was able to move into her own apartment. And um, she really credits her current support system to the, in the, the independence to, and independence to the resources um, and the staff members at AFG. So um, and she's doing great. So that's kind of just one example of how those services can help a young woman. Um, so next there is our prevention department, which serves um, school-age girls, elementary through high school age. Um, they're not homeless, but they come to us for extra support. So it essentially is to keep girls engaged um, in their education and focused on a positive future. So during the school year, we provide a safe after-school program three nights a week um, where we serve dinner, um, help girls with homework, and teach um, workshops about a variety of topics, including everything from positive self-esteem to alcohol and drug prevention. Um, so the pre prevention department also offers a free summer camp for girls every summer, which includes fun and educational activities 
throughout uh, that entire summer. And it's a vital program because it's a safe place for girls to stay during the day throughout most of the summer. Um, and it also provides them a positive learning environment where they can, um, um, which can kind of go a long way to, for girls to help them secure a positive future. Um, so one of the things we're really proud of in this the prevention program is that every year for the past 16 years now, 100% of the girls staying in our prevention program so they were old enough to graduate high school. Um, they have graduated, and all but two of them went on to college. So yeah. this program really works, and we're really doing everything that we can to sustain and expand it. So one of the ways that we're doing that is through um, our new asset building project. So it is, if you've heard about asset building projects before, usually it kind of focuses on like businesses, but for this, um, this program, we're focusing on helping girls save money for their um, education after high school. So it's geared towards the middle school girls in the prevention programs. Um, so we help them prepare financially, academically, and culturally for um, their educational futures after high school. Um, we started the program last year and we enrolled 30 girls um, and have enrolled about 10 more this year. Um, so they've opened a college savings account um, and themselves and their families are um, committed to depositing about $5 per week into their um, savings account, which uh, is a special savings account designated for saving funds um, restricted for post-secondary education. And then right now, up to $500 of their savings will be matched um, by AFG. Um, we hope that we'll be able to increase that throughout the years. Um, but this money is just, you know, as you know, there's lots of gaps between, you know, the funding that girls might get through um, grants or scholarships for loans, so this will just help cover those costs like for books, transportation, and things um, things like that. But the act of saving will also help each woman stay focused on their educational plans after they graduate high school. So we're really excited about that new program and um, looking to expand it as well. So lastly, we have our Outreach and Education Services Department, which serves women of all ages. So we do outreach in a couple of different ways. Um, the first is through actual physical street outreach, um, where we have staff, interns, and volunteers who um, use our agency vehicles and drive out into the streets at all hours of the night to reach out to women and provide them resources um, in any way that we can. Um, and although um, we aren't able to you know, do every day, we still kind of um, reach a lot of women through that. Program. Uh, another program in the outreach department is called Peer Education, and that program brings in high school age women who go through leadership training and then they go back out into the community to speak with their peers um, about making safe, positive choices. So they focus on everything, topics like homelessness or um, how to be safe when using the internet, um, HIV, you know, you know, a lot of a range of different issues. And we're really proud of this program because it works with at risk youth and empowers them to go out into their community and re make a real impact um, for not only themselves, but their peers as well. Um, and it is also um, kind of a job training program. The young women receive a stipend through their work in that program, so um, it kind of prepares them for um, the, working in a job, having a career. So um, lastly, we have our resource center, which includes uh, a crisis line and a crisis drop-in site. So through our resource center, we help people enroll into our programs, but we also help refer them to other programs throughout the community, um, especially when, for example, our shelter is full or if they're looking for something that we don't provide. Um, we provide material resources such as clothing and toiletries, um, and we really do our best to help people through um, our resource center find what they're looking for. So the reality is that in Detroit, there are, you know, one in four homeless individuals might not find a bed in a shelter for them to stay in. So sometimes, no matter how hard we try, there simply just aren't enough beds. So one thing that the staff in the Resource Center do, um, they've gone to take women to other shelters from Jackson, Michigan to Toledo, Ohio. There was um, young one woman who, she came in, she was unfortunately too old for our shelter. Um, she had six children with her. So. Our resource center spent most of the day finding, calling shelters um, until they found a place where the whole family could stay without splitting them up. And the um, closest place they found was um, a shelter in Toledo, so they drove 
um, them down there with one of our agency vehicles. So we really try our hardest to get everyone kind of what they need um, to, to be safe. Um, so as you can see, AHR provides um, support and resources, but the young women are really the ones doing the hard work of reaching their goals. So we really couldn't accomplish these things without support from our community, like all of you. Um, so thank you so much for that and for having me and being understanding of my um, um, That is my presentation, but I would be happy to answer any questions that you all have. So please let me know. After school, what type of hours do the volunteers put in for the after school program? So the after school program, it starts around 3 o'clock and then runs to about 7.30. Oh. So, but that's really, you know, there's <coughs> different kind of periods within that. So there's like a time when they work on their homework, so you could just help during that time. Or if you wanted to work, um, for example, our elementary group, that's out at 6.30. So they end up a little bit earlier. Or if you'd like to work with older girls, then you can stay until 7.30. So, um, that's when it's going on. Is it about the same with readers? Um, yeah, that one is kind of more flexible. The girl, the young women in the shelter, they have different kind of, um, you know, the classes and counseling and stuff that they do in group um, meetings. So that can kind of be moved around, you know, when they might be doing Needed. something and, Got it. You, know, you know, hang out with the, the kids and read with them. The ones in like the after school program. Yeah. So we have vehicles, so we go and pick them up from school and then drive them home afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we use you know those vans also with street outreach. Too. Along with that, do they have to live within a certain proximity to the center? So for our after school program, <coughs> yes, um, they have to live in Southwest Detroit, and that is really because we want to not only help the girls in the community that we are in, but also because we are going to pick them up so we can't drive too far away and be able to have them back, you know. We, there's really just a brief window in between school and half and getting them there. So, um, but our shelter, you don't have, there's no um, barrier to where you could be. So um, I was just looking at this list of things they're looking for. Um, do you also take like used items, like the like kids' clothes? Yeah, like baby yeah. clothes. Yeah, there are a couple of things on there that you'll notice will say new in front of them. So those things. Okay. Um, there's a couple of reasons for you know different things mm -hmm. you have to have new, but clothing, yes, definitely. Our clothing closet um, is full of donated, gently used clothing, and it's a really, um, it's a really big help for everyone in our program. So um, yeah. Any other questions? Oh, back there, Kim. I have a yeah. question. Just looking at your list, for the clothing items that says new tacks, but under the baby, it doesn't specify new. The reason I ask is because I have a bag with my son's socks hanging at his door. Uh -huh. Do the baby socks have to be new or? Um, probably not. The reason why we have new for new bra socks and underwear is this is really, I was just talking to someone who manages our resource center, and that's most of the women that use it. Um, Anyone in our program can use it, but most of the women that use it are um, coming in from off the street. So they might be involved in sex work, they might be homeless, um, and this is really like a place for them where it's like they feel like they're shopping in a department section. And mm -hmm. so hygiene reasons, we want those items to be new, but also just to make them feel like, you know, fresh and, and make them feel good. So, but babies, I know we um, have lots of different, use, you know, gently used baby items. So. <laughs> Any other questions before we turn it back over to Cynthia? <laughs> I, we were talking before there's, that there may be programs that you know about at Wayne State that some of the girls might be into women might be interested in here, and I like I know of um, uh, the uh, teacher program, College of Ed, which on um, art therapy, and it's like very low cost. Twenty-five dollars for sixteen weeks of art therapy, um, or if there's other, and I know there's the string instruments, and when it would be great to also be able to share the resources that Wayne at Wayne State 
um, and I know they change all the time. So you might, if you have I, uh, programs that you think would be useful, if you could let me know, and then I will make sure, you know, I want to collect some of those things and let them know. Don and I. Go ahead. I was just going to say I have um, business cards, so if anyone wants to, just let me know and I can. And did everyone get a flyer from the, um, the brochure that you needed? Mm -hmm. Did everyone get one of those? Mm -hmm. uh, I was just going to say, Dawn and I um, visited the, as we mentioned, Dawn and I visited the, the, the facility there. And um, it was really enlightening and interesting for me to know, to kind of circle around and to know um, the, the things that the facility does, which I wasn't really thinking of sharing my ignorance, that I was, really wasn't thinking that they kind of do with one thing was a commercial kitchen, and um, which I don't know if you know, if anyone knows what a commercial kitchen is, and opposed to just like your kitchen at your house, <laughs> which is a, a really big thing, and, and the uh, young women there are, are able to not only um, participate, participate in the cooking and, and things like that, but um, also they have staff that, that prepare meals too. So it was really enlightening to go there. Um, so any more questions? I would maybe crazy. <coughs> do you accept male volunteers or just female volunteers? Yeah, <laughs> yeah we do. Okay, um, I know some groups, you know, you, you know I didn't know if yeah. you male volunteers. Yeah, all of our volunteers that work directly with the young women go through a pretty extensive background check, um, clearances. So definitely everyone is welcome. Oh. <laughs> we have lots of male volunteers. Well, thank you, Alex, for sharing with us. Thank you. For so having you. Having you. Check out their website. Excellent information here, what we do, get involved, news and events and so forth, so you can find out more detailed information. I have one more question. So do you, like if I was volunteering, if my daughter wanted to come with me, or is there an age required? Yeah, I think if you were with her, I think that would be okay. Um, there are some different rules for minors, but um, actually if you have the brochure, so inside of it, there's an email address for our volunteering service manager, her name is Jenny, so email her to so know um, more kind of that. So maybe Alex will just stand right here for a minute. <laughs> just in case. Yeah. Um, so, so the two pieces of information, well, really three pieces, pieces of information that we wanted to share. Which this is our wish list, which uh, Alex provided for you. So the idea of what we want to do is just like last year's snow plow, we wanted to have our um, location sites have the box. And this is the box that you can get today. And then Dawn had made up some flyers for us to place on the box. After you decorate it, if you like. Right, wrap it with <laughs> wrapping paper or however you might want to decorate it. So this is the idea. And can those who volunteer to be location sites stand up so we'll know who you are, who you are even though you have a list? Yes. And then also the, the wish list, and we can get more, more copies of this, the wish list and the, this flyer goes on the box after you, de if you want to de decorate it. So the idea is to have your box in a central location or not. You can put it where, wherever you think there's traffic that people will donate. And then um, if you want to leave the box, if you feel it's secure enough, you can leave the box in the area and take the items out each day or at a period of time and, and to secure those. Um, and then we'll, we'll, our due date is December 16th. Sixteen. Sixteen. Which yeah. I think is a Friday. And so then we're, we're planning to yeah. take the items over to a to the girls on that Monday. So we'll be in touch with you, uh, those who are contact uh, location sites. Also, the other flyer here, because we, we felt like many of um, many of you would want to donate items from the wish list, which would be more a little bit more convenient, but also there's an opportunity on this sheet, other ways to donate your time and your talent. So um, Alex provided us 
10 ways that we, we can donate our time and our talents. Of course, two of the ways are our money, monetary, or um, item. But there's some other ways which me and Dawn had kind of mulled over um, if there's an adopted, a family or adopted, uh, you know, an adopted project, there's an opportunity for that. So that's a, a good choice as well, especially around the Christmas time and the holiday times. Um, another thing that I found interesting on here <coughs> was going to the site and helping um, with um, like a package of the hygiene oh, items yeah. for going out and giving to the girls too. So there's opportunity for that as well. So that's your sheet for that. And we do have your contact information on here. Yes. And this definitely isn't an all in all inclusive list. It's not an all inclusive list. So if you have ideas or things that you think like, oh, we did this, then um, definitely contact Jenny, whose contact information is on there. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. So, any other questions? Mm -hmm. So, for this particular project for one state, would you prefer the items here or monetary gift or your own? It's what you want. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so you can donate from the items or you can do the monetary <coughs> gift. Which, if you're doing a monetary gift, we prefer it to go directly yeah. to the address there. Mm -hmm. But if, um, if you're donating items from the wish list, which some, one of the items is a gift card, so if you, you might not want to do that. You might not want to secure that in the box. <laughs> so you want to encourage people who want to give a gift card to just hand it to you. And then we'll take that all over. <laughs> Any other questions, Helen? If you're not sure what your department wants to do, you know, say they decide later they want to do these, like, buy all the items for the box, who would you contact to get the box? Um, who's in your building? What do you mean? Who's in your building? Is your building on here? She's the she's the volunteer. Okay. Andra, Andra is for undergrad life. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You can, to the honors. So you'll have the boxes. I will have the box, <laughs> but it's not you. It's not just the library. So it's the honors college, right. second floor. Yeah. Come see. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Um, feel free to um, ask faculty, um, students, anybody to give. Um, and I think, and, um, given what happened a couple of days ago, and that this is an opportunity to do something positive and, um, and reach out to other people in, in a positive way, I'm looking out for our community. And um, I think and I'm looking for ways to sort of counterbalance. And I'm, I'm, I think this is a, if we can make a real good effort to do something really good here as a union and as you know, colleagues, um, I, I think that's a good way to use our energy. Right? For me, my, my anger. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I encourage you to ask, you know, to, to, to really reach out. And we can't give the list of faculty and academic staff in all the buildings, help flyer, encourage us. I also wanted to, to jump onto that because I agree so much. We uh, have a different sort of scenario about life that has just happened, and so there's going to be a lot of work figuring out how the union um, operates in that in that situation. So if you're interested in trying to tackle some of that work, please come up and see me, and we'll just um, start to build a, a group of people that's thinking about those things because uh, um, lame duck in November is going to be a really intense period uh, in Michigan going into next year's um, reality of the political scene. So uh, this is this you know this is perfect for this time, this project. So thank you, Mark and I think it's all about just helping people in general, yeah. right? Yeah. So we're all a community, Wayne State community, the southwest Detroit area. So for our service project we're really happy to have alternative for girls as our option. Yeah. 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 Yeah.